Um, thank you for your time and attention today. My name is Zach Hildenbrand. I'm with C4 Laboratories. And today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Canvas research and uh, where it has been and where it is going. Um, I always find it uh, rather imperative to talk a little bit about my journey in this field of research because it is rather unconventional and it will probably give you a greater um, context as to where we believe that this field is going. Um, so I'm a, I'm a cancer biochemist by training. Uh, I started working on formal independent cancers uh, from a structural perspective. And then I went into working on a treatment for chronic myeloid leukemia at UT Southwestern. And again, that was actually relatively unconventional uh, research because uh, we were actually using arsenic uh, to, to cure uh, kids with cancer. Um, most people think that arsenic is bad in bears, but uh, if you use it appropriately at the molecular level, it can do uh, quite wonder. Um, and then, now that brought me into this field of research. And uh, when I got into cannabis research, I kind of looked around, looked at the peer-reviewed literature, there wasn't a whole lot there. And what I would say is that it was primarily what I call bro science. Now, bro science in cannabis is, okay, we grew this plant, uh, what do you think the THC content is? Go ahead and try it. Oh, I think it's 20%, bro. How do you know that? Oh, bros know, bro. We just, bros know. <laughs> what should we use it for? Oh, uh, pain management. How do you know? Oh, just bros know. I just, I know. Come on, I know. So, that, unfortunately, is a terrible affliction um, for myself, coming from a traditional research background. Uh, where we're using a lot of advanced techniques spending a lot of money and getting down to very, very finite resolution um, on complex issues, bro science is just completely unacceptable. And so I really wanted to be a part of a movement where we could uh, bring cannabis research out of the primordial ooze and get the attention that it deserves. Um, I think we can all agree here that cannabis uh, is uncharted waters. And as far as uh, the next wonder drug, uh, the next compound that's going to be the, the, the cure-all uh, therapy, I, I think that uh, cannabis holds a lot of those secrets and it's about time that we spend a lot of resources, time and energy, surround ourselves with intelligent people and unlock those secrets. So that's what we're dedicated towards doing. I'm going to talk a little bit about here starting at the beginning. Uh, we'll get into cannabinoid biogenesis, a lot of, a lot of fun stuff here. Uh, the uh, queen bee, if you will, is uh, C B G A, <laughs> right here. Okay. So from C B G A, the cannabis plant expresses a number of different enzymes that allow C B G A to differentiate into T H C A, C B D A, C B C A, and then as we go through the process of decarboxylation by way of heat, then you get the more active forms of delta-9 THC, also known as the, the THC that we know and love, uh, CBD and CBC res respectively. Um, we also know that there are also uh, other cannabinoids. We have instead of uh, THC delta-9, we have delta-8. It's just a different isomerization of, of uh, delta-9. We also uh, have delta-11. Uh, Delta-11 is not naturally expressed in the plant, and where you get that is when you ma mainly ingest any kind of edible form, and then your liver is going to uh, convert that Delta-9 into Delta-11. Why is that important? Well, we're, we'll kind of get, you know, again, this further gets to the point of bro science. You know, a lot of people go out and they make their medibles, and they, uh, they don't test them. They just say, yeah, this has probably got 10 milligrams per dose, and it's probably going to be good for sleep. Yeah, let's just go ahead and mass uh, market this accordingly. Well, what happens is when you ingest those metals, uh, that THC delta 9 is going to be converted into a much more psychoactive THC delta 11. And it's kind of a double whammy. So you take it in through, through ingestion, and it has a much more delayed response. So here you are, you're sitting on the couch, you're watching, uh, let's say, House of Cards, and you're just crushing these edibles. And you're waiting, you know, wow, it's, I'm not feeling anything, so I'm just going to eat more. 
And so that delayed onset is going to hit you, and it's going to hit you very hard because now you have a much more psychoactive form. Um, so that's where you have to, to crawl out of the primordial ooze of bro science, get your products tested so that you know what you have. I always give the analogy that we're talking about medicine here. No one would doubt out that. So why are we treating it like it's not medicine? Would you ever go into Wells Fargo, or sorry, not Wells Fargo, uh, Walgreens? <laughs> would you ever go into Walgreens and just, they had a bucket of vault pills, purple, red. Um, yeah, I have hypertension, just gonna grab a couple handfuls of this and let's uh, hope for the best. Yeah, nobody does that. Pharmaceuticals are supposed to be a targeted uh, therapy. And what happens, obviously you take pill A and then you have side effects, so you need pill B for the side effects of pill A, and that's, that's basically how it works. But it's a targeted uh, therapy, and that's where we need to go with, uh, with cannabis. So getting back to the uh, can cannabinoid biogenesis, um, apart from the isomers there of THC, CBN. Uh, CBN, there are no high CBN strains of cannabis. CBN is basically the result of oxidation of either THC or CBD. And so one thing that we found is a lot of people are gravitating towards a, a product, maybe it's a tincture that's high in CBN and it's a really great sleep aid. Um, and uh, what you need for that is you either need time for that natural oxidation to occur, or you can expedite that process using a reducing agent, uh, something like liquid nitrogen. Uh, we're seeing a lot of people having a lot of success with that. If you want to convert over into CBN. Um, and then one of the lesser known compounds here is CBL, and that can be produced from CBC as a function of UV exposure. So, you know, we get into a lot of this targeted uh, use of ca uh, cannabis, and if we know how to get to our target molecules, then we can go about things, you know, intelligently. Okay, uh, before I get into some of our latest research here, I just want to talk about optimization, um, important, important issues. It's, it's all very much data driven. Um, it, for me, I, I also have a tremendous background in environmental chemistry, done some work in that field. Uh, looking at your environment is, is unbelievably critical. I think we've heard from a number of, of experts so far where they talk about nutrients and soil and whatnot. Um, water is really a big issue, I think, that is overlooked. Um, water is so unbelievably critical to all life forms that to just think, well, we'll just use whatever water and hope that it works out, um, I think is rather naive. Um, in Arizona, we have very, very hard water. Um, we also have water that's rich in iron oxides, and iron oxides tend to chelate arsenic. Now, as I said to you before, um, where arsenic was being used in a treatment for chronic myeloid leukemia, you're talking about parts per trillion of arsenic trioxide in conjunction with imatinib. But when we talk about groundwater that has 50 parts, 50 parts per million in some cases arsenic, this is just horrible water that has to be treated over and over and over again. Um, it's, after that treatment, it's not optimal um, necessarily for your operation. And then people just don't know that. Um, treatment of water can come with chlorinated solvents many times, and uh, you don't want that in your water either. So, you know, you have to look at all of these variables. If you want to be growing premium cannabis, world-class cannabis, you have to know every single step. Um, it's absolutely critical. Now, other things that, uh, one thing I'd like to touch on here, these are just thoughts that I'm throwing out there, things to kind of stimulate thought, but as this research continues to evolve, we also need to look at things like epigenetics. Epigenetics is in a, a kind of a new, um, field of genetics in that you can really understand how genes are expressed and how they're regulated. And this was best illustrated in a murine experiment where they took a series of mice and they made one of the mice diabetic. Okay, so the mouse wasn't diabetic previously, you know, you fed it a bunch of pancakes and corn and all that good stuff, and now it's diabetic. Well, its offspring then was diabetic. Its dad wasn't originally diabetic. It, it, through environmental conditions, it became diabetic, and it passed those genes, or the expression of those genes, onto the subsequent generations. So where I'm going with that is, if you don't know how you're treating your plants, and if you aren't treating them with love and care, and 
you know, if they're not your babies, then chances are they're not going to perform well, and in the subsequent generations, they're going to carry on, you know, those epigenetic changes, and they're not going to perform well ever. So it's important to know every step of the way. Again, if you're in, in the quest of excellence and to, to provide premium cannabis to all of us who love that, you need to have every step uh, absolutely dialed in. Now, there are a couple other things that, uh, that we can look at here in terms of monitoring uh, some of the changes. Uh, we heard from the guys up in Oregon there. We heard from a uh, good friend here, Adam Jocks. We heard from Christian West. And those guys are more or less the Galileos of, of cannabis. And what they're doing is they're using science to track the progress of their plants, and then they're making intelligent decisions based on data. It's, a, it's an incredibly novel thought in a field plagued by grow science, uh, but it makes common sense to you know, the rest of us that are trying to attack this from a more traditional angle. Uh, another thing that we're trying to understand is uh, endogenous versus exogenous cannabinoids. And I just pick THC, for instance. So endogenous meaning that you have these cannabinoids that are being produced in the plant matter, and then exogenous is on the outside or would be in these trichomes. So if we can understand the difference between uh, cannabinoid production in the plant and also in the trichomes, then perhaps we can figure out a way to uh, modulate uh, that expression. You know, for instance, we talk about people doing juicing. Um, what if there was a way that we could determine which genes expressed or were turned on to enable uh, endogenous expression of cannabinoids? We could push that equilibrium, and now all of a sudden you have a highly potent juice just from plants. You know, this, these are the type of research questions that you know we're, we're, we're just starting to ask, and I think that there's going to be a lot of exciting discoveries um, in the near future. So uh, I'm going to get into the data now. Uh, so back this this actually started last year. Um, my uh, friend and colleague here, Ryan, and I started C4 Laboratories, and um, I made a point that it was uh, absolutely critical that we uh, become heavily involved in cannabis research. Um, so we started what's called the C4 Cannabinomics Collaborative, and it's a collaboration with my uh, good friend and colleague, Dr. Kevin Shug at the University of Texas at Arlington, where we're using a $13 million analytical facility called the Shimatsu Center for Advanced Analytical Chemistry. It's absolutely world class, one of a kind. And with those instruments in there, we're actually able to dive into this cannabis and really get our hands dirty. So the general thought was, okay, we're going to take cannabis, we're going to screen it using a number of different techniques, we're going to discover new molecules, uh, maybe we go in and we discover the structure of those molecules, uh, you know, for instance, with NMR or extra crystallography, but more importantly, we use a lot of um, basic, based on gene expression profiles, then we can figure out what those molecules, what response they are eliciting, and then we know exactly uh, whether or not that compound can be used as a therapy. And if we want to take it a step further, once we determine what, that, uh, what those compounds are doing and the mechanism through which they're listing their response, uh, we can figure out how to maybe optimizing it. So if we know which, uh, for, for example, which proteins interact with these molecules, we can look at binding assays and we can model, and essentially we can take our original understanding of that structure and what it does, and perhaps optimize it uh, with a derivation. So once we figure out what's in there, what it does, the structure of it, how it works, then we can work backwards and figure out which of these strains has those molecules, and then we'll try to cultivate uh, those strains in subsequent generations so that they can express more of that compound, thus being a more potent therapy. So, I'll talk a little bit about some of the putative cannabinoids here. Um, obviously, we have uh, THC, anti-inflammatory, analgesic, neuroprotective. Uh, it reduces uh, intraocular pressure. This is great for people with glaucoma. Uh, spasticity and muscle tension. Uh, we have CBD, fantastic molecule modulating THC-induced psychoactivity, anti-anti-tumorigenic activity, and it's a very potent anti-convulsant, uh, or THC, and it's an incredible appetite stimulant. Um, you see people that are afflicted with uh, HIV or other viruses um, it, it, it absolutely ravaged their body 
You know, they need something like this that can trigger an appetite so that they can sustain themselves throughout their treatment. Um, also, incredible anti-tumorigenic activity. Uh, CBC, antibacterial, antifungal. Um, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could go into a hospital setting and people didn't have to deal with skin infections by Pseudomonas aeruginosa or, or uh, MRSA? We could do that perhaps with a topical CBC treatment. Uh, we have CBG, excellence for uh, inflammatory bowel disorder. Um, potent antibacterial, anti-tumorigenic. There's a there seems to be a, a consistent profile here um, as a tumor therapy as a, a anti-cancer therapy. Other ones that, that I'm particularly interested in are these two right here, these, these derivations. So THC V is a propylated form of THC. And just the same, you have the propylated form of CBD, which is CBDV. Now these are incredible energy stimulants and uh, metabolic activators. Also improves glucose tolerance and a potent anti-inflammatory. So as someone who's done a lot of work in Texas and lived there a long time, uh, where macaroni and cheese is considered a vegetable, um, I think we would probably be in pretty good shape if we could use something rather holistic, plant-based, to help those folks. Um, you know, who eat lots of their vegetables. Okay, so get into some of the structures here, and uh, these are the molecules that, that we are screening for, and I'm going to get into some of the molecules uh, that we're now discovering. So you can buy standards for um, all of these. So you have your THC, CBD, CBC. Um, my understanding is uh, we have said THCV. Um, we can do all of these in-house. Now, now the B squad players, um, I say that, you know, kind of jokingly, you know, a lot of people thought that Steph Curry from Davidson University was a B squad player, and uh, we know how that turned out. I think the same is, is the case here. So CBDB, uh, we're also looking at CBL, CBE, CBT, and ISO THC. Uh, you cannot buy standards for these, but uh, we found a way to synthesize them uh, in-house and uh, use those as a standard. All right, terpenes, my favorite. This is where the aroma, this is where the flavor comes from. And uh, made some good contacts with some, some new friends here who are, are making a cannabis-based beer. It's a great idea. Why does cannabis-based beer work? Well, uh, cannabis is the closest genetic relative to hops. And now everyone uh, wants to drink beer that's 99% hops and is, you know, IPA central. Um, and so it, it seems like there's a natural fit there. So in our lab in Arizona, we screened for, I think, 21 uh, terpenes. And these all uh, have a very similar characteristic. There are a lot of anti-inflammatories, a lot of an uh, anti-microbial. Uh, uh, um, interesting little fact, so that's where the genesis of, of IPA actually, actually came from, is that they needed a way to preserve the water, so they treated it with hops, because it had all this antibacterial um, properties. So those are the, the basic, and, and you've got things uh, in there like eucalyptol, it kind of smells like a eucalyptus tree. Uh, D-lemony, you can imagine, citrusy smell. Um, alpha and beta pine, you know, you have that, that pine um, kind of tree smell. Now, uh, here are some of the structures, but we're also getting into um, some of these new molecules that we're, uh, we're starting to see um, pop up in here. And, uh, You'll have to excuse me, some of these readings are pronounced uh, for someone with a PhD in, in chemistry. But I'm in a truck, so bear with me, I'm Canadian. Um, so you have the lanolol, a uh, very nice lavender, um, reminds me of my wife uh, making a fresh load of, of laundry that I forgot to put away. Um, but what about exophenchol? What does exophenchol do? What is it? Um, until about two months ago, we didn't know that it was quite a prevalent uh, terpene molecule in cannabis. Um, now, we're getting into some really exotic molecules here. Um, start with agros agrospirol. And then we also have aloaromadendrin. And of course, if you have aloaromadendrin, you have to have aloaromadendrin oxide. Um, we're getting into some really, really uh, exotic molecules, which gets very exciting because 
Uh, we didn't know that they were there in cannabis, but we have a better chance of figuring out what they do because these aren't Schedule A. People have been working on terpene molecules from different organisms for quite some time, so we have a better understanding of what these things actually do when we're, we're closer to using these as therapies. Um, we have things like trans 2 uh, pinanol, satabine, uh, and valencine. So uh, very, very cool molecules that we're just discovering here. that have been brominated. So halogens include, uh, you know, 
uh, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, um, that whole group. Uh, so for us to find naturally occurring brominated compounds, which we're further characterizing now, is very exciting um, because to the best of our knowledge, there wasn't any halogenated compounds, um, especially brominated compounds, uh, to be found in the literature. So again, if I may come full circle here, um, what we're doing with, with this research, and, and again, one of the beautiful things about cannabis uh, and cannabis science is that it's very inclusive. Um, we have people that just want to know, they want to push the, the quality of the product, they want to help more people, um, and that makes it uh, obviously very rewarding for us, but it does open some doors. It's uh, quite contrary to a cancer research where you got one group working on it on a, you know, a new paper, and if another group who's working on the exact same thing publishes before this group, then they don't get to paper accepted and it gets very, very uh, contentious. So it's not like that in cannabis and, and basically uh, our thought here at C4 and with our, our cannabinomics collective or collaborative, uh, we're open source. So if someone wants to come to us and wants to work, uh, how it's worked in the past is you've had a lot of people come and they bring, brought us product, uh, which we've been able to analyze and any new um, material that we're able to analyze, we're able to learn more and, and get closer to the answers um, to these important questions. So, again, we're taking this cannabis flower, and, and, and we just, again, we, just, we started on about 50 strains, and we're learning a tremendous amount, but you know, there's obviously hundreds and thousands of strains that we could be analyzing um, and dedicating our lives to this. So we're finding new molecules, um, we're finding this treasure, unlocking these secrets. The next step is going to be to take some of those molecules, once we've established what they are, um, and then figure out what they do. Um, this is something that I am very passionate about, and I, I want to take what I learned in uh, cancer research um, to this level. Uh, one nice little anecdote that I always give, I mean, I, I can go all day about talking about the therapeutic implications, the social implications, of how this plant is touching the lives of, of many. Um, if I may talk about the financial implications, though, there's an excellent example, uh, a researcher at Harvard, um, he found one compound called resveratrol. Resveratrol um, was a huge uh, boom to bust story in which um, it was uh, pulled out, it was extracted out of red wine. They found that it worked fairly well at extending the life of uh, single cell organisms. They then took that knowledge and they screened it for how this compound would do in mice. And the mice did really, really well um, when supplemented with resveratrol. Uh, at that point, I believe it was Merck or Pfizer bought that uh, company out for $600 million and uh, later found out that resveratrol really doesn't do much what they thought. Um, so unfortunately, that one didn't pan out. You know, that's one compound. Um, we're just scratching the surface with this and I, I think there's hundreds maybe thousands of compounds that we could really figure out what they do. Not only cannabinoids and terpenes, uh, flavonoids, uh, anti antioxidants, there's just so much in there. So after we figured out what these compounds do on a molecular level, uh, then we can look at and we can assess whether or not we can optimize uh, that therapy. Now, People talk about, well, okay, is it best to extract out uh, those compounds of interest and make them 100% pure? Or let's just make a synthetic version and it's 100% pure, just like the pharmaceutical um, approach. Uh, we don't know. The truth of the matter is, sometimes that might work, sometimes it may not. What we do know is that there's a lot of interaction between all of the cannabinoids, all of the terpenes, and they work together in synergy. Um, that's why the plant expresses them, because they work together for the plant, and uh, coincidentally, they work together for us. Um, so that's again something we're trying to, to get a handle on. Um, and then once we uh, find out you know, how these work, then we can work backwards in optimizing strains and uh, pushing the equilibrium in that genetics for particular uh, molecules. Um, it's been my opinion, there's been a lot of great work done uh, moving away from THC now into CBD. Um, but uh, I think there's going to be another shift, maybe down the road, looking at uh, CBC, and I would, I would love to see someone tackle uh, THCV and CBDV. 
Um, I think there's a tremendous potential there, but it's going to happen. I mean, it's just everyone has their hands full, and, and we're trying to burn the candle at both ends, but there's just too much to take on. Um, so, that is my spiel, and uh, I appreciate your, uh, your time and consideration. I'd like to open it up for any questions. Uh, is, I, I've heard that THCV is an appetite suppressant. Is that true? Um, that may in fact be true. Uh, the literature shows that it's an incredible metabolic stimulant and actually can uh, antagonize uh, beta oxidation, which is a way to break down um, fats. So I'm looking at it as perhaps we make a THCV rich comp, uh, you know, a supplement that is like the cannabis version of hydroxy fat. Um, maybe we do that, or maybe we grow THCV rich strains. And uh, you know we don't have to feel so guilty after we just crush you know 10, 10 pounds of turkey after Thanksgiving. We just have our little THC V, and you know we're doing a lot better. Um, and are you are you able to do this research because you've broken it into molecules and you're not researching cannabis? I mean, these are the federal law. Sure, sure. So uh, through our collaboration with uh, uh, UT Arlington, we are operating under a DEA license. And uh, so that's definitely opened some doors. Uh, it's also important um, to, you know, when we send, we, can, we send a lot of extracts as well. Um, and when you, you do an extract from flour, we need to make sure that the, the THC levels are below one milligram per milliliter. And uh, we also have to look at, okay, well, you're extracting into ethanol. Ethanol is flammable, so what do you extract into? Well, then we have to consider that as well. So, there are a number of roadblocks, even in trying to transfer these samples to do this research, but um, you know we're, we're getting it done and, and we're making some serious progress. Thanks, Zach, for the presentation. Uh, I have a question more of a resource. So, sure. Uh, one is a protocol for dosing for, like you said, for HIV/AIDS patients. Um, specifically, my question is interactions with Yeah. So, um, some very well respected um, neurosurgeons and pain doctors are concerned with the interactions, for example, with ketamine. So, cannabis and ketamine. So, the interactions in the dosing for those patients, just like you said, with edible, is, do you have a resource or is that something that you're working towards? I know this project can be. Yeah, we're, we're, we're certainly working towards that. Um, you know, there, there's so many questions that need to be answered that are patient specific. And uh, I think the research just, is just getting started and it hasn't, unfortunately, we, we haven't had the resources at our fingertips to really push that equilibrium, but I think we're very close. Um, as for that question about HIV, um, I found uh, a lot of people are doing very well with uh, exogenous hormone therapy coupled with cannabis. Um, so they're using a lot of testosterone therapy. Uh, they would probably drop the ketamines and any kind of heavy narcotic and go into cannabis, and they're doing very, very well. Oh, I don't, I, I, I don't know. I mean, this is, again, just, you're getting into the preliminary literature, people are writing editorials, none of this is peer-reviewed yet, and so I would characterize it as anecdotal, but, you know, these are an N of one or two that, you know, you need some position maybe observing. Are the terpenes in cannabis specific to cannabis plants and not available in other plants? Or is there oh, that's a great question. Um, so there are some that are specific to cannabis, you know, some of those exotic ones that I just put up there. Um, but uh, most of them, you know, are found in, in other compounds. I mean, hops, for example, closest genetic relative, tons of terpenes, um, and uh, there's a lot of overlap there. But uh, you know, there, there are a couple, and as we discover more, I'm sure we'll find some that are unique to cannabis. It appears that uh, recent research is indicating that the, the terpenes are having a inhibited specific effect on, on different individuals, and the percentage of those terpenes in the respective strains is something now that I guess people are taking it out in the extract and then adding it back in different percentages to have different effects. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're definitely trying to optimize it, what I would call in vitro at that point. I've always uh, preferred in vivo, um, so 
So and what I mean by that is not pulling them out and putting them back in, but uh, I think they're pretty therapeutic on their own. Some of the best cannabis uh, that I've ever enjoyed um, has been not relatively high in cannabinoids, but just loaded uh, with terpenes. And it's just the way that, that it was grown, the way that it was preserved. Uh, maybe have a five or six fold terpene uh, uh, concentration than your normal average Joe cannabis. And it's amazing. And it's because of that synergistic effect of all those terpenes coming together. Um, so that's, that's what's really exciting because I think there's a lot more terpene molecules in there that people realize. And uh, we should give them a little bit more respect. You know, we're giving THC respect, we're giving CBD respect. Well, those terpenes are important as well. Okay, uh, so major, major solvent is, is just methanol. It's, it's pretty good um, from my experience. Uh, we've messed around with, with some other solvents, but uh, you know, we hear people uh, using other alcohols, but no, it's pretty simple. Methanol works. What about THC like as an acetate? Do you have any studies about that? No, no, great question. Um, do we have not dived into that. In your studies, the determination, the conclusion that the growing environment will have a great effect on the output of the plant and its benefits. 100%. 100%. And that's going to be through those epigenetic pathways. So that plant, it's certainly going to come back. So let's say we're using bad water and we're depriving it of water and so it's wilting a little bit, but then you bring it back. Um, I believe that you won't be able to see that change in the genetic code, but it, it is happening on the molecular level. So we should just treat our plants with respect every single time that will carry over into subsequent generations. Is it mostly mark sorry, it was is it mostly marketing when people say something to the effect that certain cultivars are high in a C, in C B D or THC or certain um, certain constituents? Uh, yeah, there's actually two problems there. I mean, and, and again, coming from more traditional medicine, I think people come out with these strain names and the nomenclature, it's, I can't follow it, and then it's like, again, bro, science is like, oh, bro, this is, I've got right. and dog OG, and then he takes it home, like, yeah, I got this uh, strawberry OG Kush. Right. <laughs> and it's like, how, how do we actually know? That's Yeah, that's uh, a big question that I've always yeah, kind of I, asked. I worry about that all the time. So yeah, we have heard it come in and people say, oh, no, my uh, my blackberry kush always measures at 17, um, you know, every time. And it's like, I don't think so. You know, it's going to vary from plant to plant in the same grill, let alone from subsequent grills. Um, I've heard that uh, there's a group that is... From yeast. Okay. Oh, I've heard of that too. Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, so they figured out the enzymes that can express these uh, compounds and do the biogenesis in vitro, and you've got yeast now producing these molecules. And I think that, that definitely has some promise, but now we're back to, okay, we grow up all this yeast, we lyse the yeast cells, now we extract this THC, and we just have enough, we have a, what I would call a biosynthetic, I mean it's recombinant, um, but it's a biosynthetic version, right? Just like a synthetic version you make through organic chemistry. Um, whereas what we're finding is that, again, give those terpenes some love, they're important, you know? Let's go through the plant um, and, and extract it, you know, with all of its little buddies, you know, working together. Um, so right now I'll get back to you. Proposing a different type of classification system using terpenes and chemical footprints classified different sure. types of strains. Is that possible? Well, well sure. Um, I think because you have more terpenes, and so it's like a much broader signature, if you will, um, that's going to take a lot of work. You know, that's, you know, DNA, whether it's you look at kind of classifying things um, based on. Um, you, their phenotype, how they express those genes, um, it's going to take a long, long time, but I would advise them to get started. And maybe that would alleviate some of the concerns with, you know, I have, you know, Ken Dog X or whatnot and totally mischaracterizing it. If we actually know what this, how this plant is performing based on you know, its signature, then we know exactly what it is and we can just work backwards. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, uh, exactly, right. exactly. Because right. obviously you can't do it through phenotype. You can't just look at the plant and know. Um, there's a lot of debate about uh, which environment grows the most full spectrum plant profile. You know, indoor, outdoor, oh, soil, boy. soil, organic, <laughs> Do you have an opinion? Uh, as someone who you know can't even grow, you know one plant, uh, never done it, uh, never had any success. I, I have no idea. Um, we have a guy over here who knows. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I can't really comment on that. But um, it, that's where I think it's very exciting. You can take a guy like me, collaborate with a grower, look at how the environment is affecting the product, and then proceed accordingly. Um, we obviously heard about how uh, indicas versus sativas need to be treated differently. Nutrients, metals, soil, water. Um, so we should really follow that if we really want to get it out in. Yeah. Yes, sir. In fact, we talked earlier, I use clear oil for uh, my extract. Yeah. Uh, so winterize, distill, stir. At that point, does the strain or even indica versus sativa matter once the once it's, it's gone through that much processing? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, if you're deterping, essentially you've lost all the, those flavoring components, but you also have a variance in the cannabinoid profile. Um, so you might have a different ratio in CBD to THC, you might have different CBG, different CBN, THCV in there. There's going to be some minor variation. Yes. Let's say let's say uh, client works with, with your laboratory. Yeah. What's the cycle time or, or uh, uh, time? What's the turnaround time actually? You want to analyze some product? Twenty four hours. Wow. So I ship uh, FedEx. <laughs> well, we can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a trap. California. <laughs> um, no, what we're, what we're investigating and trying to do with uh, out-of-state clients is to give them a kit where they can do the extraction themselves and then send it to us while you know keeping the THC concentration below that certain level and then also making sure it's not flammable. Um, you know, it kind of handicaps us, but that's just the nature of the beast. Um, but yeah, we, we turn things around in, in 24 hours because as we find, uh, a lot of the producers and uh, these dispensaries, they have something that's really, really good. They can't wait a week to get that data back. Um, they they want to know what's in there right away because they're going to sell it very quickly. So uh, we need to respond to if I If I may add to that, you know, the, the quantification of cannabinoids and terpenes, um, those things are a relatively quick runtime, and there is a, a volume limitation to that 24-hour turnaround. Um, it's about a 30-minute uh, process to identify those uh, residual solvents and terpenes. So obviously, once you get above the 40, 45 samples in a day, then obviously the 24 hours is a, is a very tall task to fulfill. Um, but generally, for those basic analysis, we can do 24 hours. The more complex analyses, such as the pesticides, fungicides, growth regulators, uh, full mold counts, and those type of things, um, is more from the uh, 72 hours to maybe four days or so. Guy, no, I'm just trying to <laughs> clarify and not over promise. <laughs> Any other? Yes, sir. I, yeah, just going back to your, your statement about the genetics and the viability of plants yep. and generating Wouldn't you say, though, that an organic plant is probably going to be epigenetically more uh, grounded in its genetic roots than something that maybe was raised chemically? We have no idea. That uh, sounds like a sound logic, but we have no idea. Um, people just started doing epigenetic studies on mice and Drosophila four or five years ago. And what we're talking about epigenetics is basically that DNA becomes methylated, and if it becomes methylated, then it's no longer going to be expressed as RNA and then turn into a protein. Um, so I don't know. That's what I want to find out. Um, to be honest with you, you know, I'm in a position here where I'm working with this great team, and uh, I know that there's, there's treasure in that box. And we just need the resources to get in that box and find it. It's there. And uh, that's what I'm excited um, to embark on. Yes, sir. Uh, you said there's multiple molecules available to treat certain diseases or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Yeah. They, they all work in unison and symbiotically together, right? So if yeah. you're extracting one, are you, 